All right, so in this video, we're going to go over a, a few things. Um, we're going to go over uh, creating a match move in Nuke using the camera tracker node. Uh, we're going to use the uh, we're going to use that match move uh, to create a point cloud uh, that will accurately represent our scene, a dense point cloud. And then we're going to use that point cloud to use to create a scene mesh, and we'll see what we can do with that from there. Um, so this is our clip here. Uh, it is uh, just a simple outdoor shot moving into a tree. Um, it's kind of uh, it's it's a little bit sort of best of um, best case scenario. Uh, since uh, there's nothing moving in the scene um, that we don't want to be tracking and it's a pretty straightforward nice high detail um, uh, setup here so uh, that's just to make it a little bit easier on my part so we're going to start off by creating a match move node uh, camera tracker let's move down here right? and <clears throat> so this was shot on an iPhone uh, 5s so we'll see how that plays into setting up our camera tracker uh, so our camera tracker is going to set up. Now, if we did have um, something moving in the scene that we didn't want, uh, a little animal scurrying across here or something, uh, we'd really want to um, create a roto, roto node here and roto it out. Um, I want to roto it out very roughly um, and just kind of move it as a blob through the scene. The, the, really, the thing you want to do is just avoid picking up trackers on it and you know of course how close you get to it and, and how tight of a roto it is depends on how much other tracking information you have in this scene but we're not going to roto anything out for this particular one <clears throat> let's just go through our settings real quick for the camera tracker uh, source is obviously the sequence uh, we can do a series of still images if we just need to um, use it to uh, track out points in space uh, our mask would be our source alpha if we did roto it in line like that, um, or uh, maybe someone else wrote it for you. Uh, range, um, if your clip is longer, it will track the whole clip. Uh, so uh, our clip is 125 frames, so you could just override it there. So those are the basic settings, pretty straightforward. Um, these camera settings are the ones we want to pay attention to. We want to sort of try to give a hint to as to what the camera is doing in the scene. In this case, uh, it is a free camera motion. Uh, rotation would be for tripod sets. Um, linear motion would be things like uh, uh, dolly tracks, straight dolly tracks, or uh, sliders. And planar motion would be uh, motions that are uh, happening in a, in a, in a two-dimensional plane to some degree. OK, our focal length. Um, now, it is an iPhone 5S, so we do know that these answers here um, focal length, we're going to say um, approximate constant. Um, as much as I want to call it, I know, as much as I want to know that it's 4.1 millimeters, I have a guess that it's a little bit different than that. Um, and then, of course, um, my film back is going to be 6 millimeters and 4.8. Now, I apologize for the low quality video source, but it's kind of what I had on hand. <coughs> so, just before we go ahead and track this, I just want to pop through these real quick. User tracks, are, these are tracks that you can do yourself. Um, I'm going to do that in another video. Uh, that's when you've got less information or some troublesome things and you just want to really lock it down. Uh, this will revisit. Um, settings here is sort of uh, what happens when we hit the track button. The number of features we have, um, how much they get separated, um, whole bunch of different things like our, our default error setups you know minimum track length three uh, we can change this to whatever we want now or later I'm gonna leave it at three so we can change it later um, and here we are with our camera motions and things like this reference frames and whatnot <clears throat> so I'm actually gonna bump this up to uh, 250 um, just because I think I can get a little bit of a better solve the scene we'll visit later um, output and node information pretty straightforward all right so we got all this set up uh, pretty close and we're gonna say track and what you'll notice is that um, these little orange X's represent our um, 250 track points that we requested and it'll go in and look for the most obvious features that it can track and again this is exactly why we want to remove those things that are running through the scene or if anything that's blowing in the breeze and it's a still day so not a big deal and what's great about this tracker is it runs through forward 
and then it runs in reverse, re-verifying the tracks that it did and getting rid of the ones that are really pro problematic, things that jump in unexpected ways and um, starts assigning error codes to them or error um, variations. So we'll come back out here and we have our points and we can scrub through and we get an idea of what they are. Now, right away, I just want to hit solve. I'm kind of treating this as if I'm a compositor and not so much as if I'm uh, a match move artist. I'm not a match move artist. So um, most of my most of the time that I'm doing tracks like this, I'm trying to fix a compositing problem and hopefully I can get away with doing it here uh, before I send it off to someone who's dedicated uh, to doing that. So that's how we're approaching it. I'm not going to try to be creating miracles here. All right, so our solve uh, generates this uh, setup here where we have the green trackers which fall well within the bounds of our errors and our red trackers which uh, fall outside the bounds of our errors. And what we get is a number here. This is our uh, solve error. 1.8 uh, is pretty high. Um, it's pretty far off. Um, <clears throat> I'm not really going to go down and dig down on getting that low because I want to keep this video fairly short and there's other sources for that information. But we are going to do a little bit of pruning. So we've got 250 points per frame um, and they're doing pretty well. So we've got a lot of leeway for this. Uh, so we can go and be pretty, um, pretty ruthless with how we trim these up. So our minimum track length, three frames. And if we look here, minimum track length, minimum, we can see how many trackers um, fit uh, in our minimum track length um, zone. And I'm going to go ahead and start raising this up. And we're going to watch trackers pop up here. And you can see that what that is is any tracker that falls outside of this minimum length, right? So any tracker that's less than nine frames long, it's going to turn red. And, you know, what I really kind of want to say is I want tracks that sustain throughout the scene uh, so that we can get a better read on the information. We can also lower our maximum track error and our tracker error um, so that we can get... Um, really only the best of the best, right? And and this is going to vary based on how your scene is. Um, but in general, I'm getting rid of a bunch of stuff here. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm going to hit here, delete rejected. Right, and that's going to get rid of all those um, trackers uh, that that don't fit this uh, solve. Um, Get some ones way out here in the distance. I don't know if I really, really want those. I can I can manually delete them. Uh, if you see ones that are popping around, um, you know, popping around too much, things that pop out, we can get rid of them. And slowly uh, and surely, what you'll see is your solve error going down. We got it down to 1.3, and I'm going to say for our demonstration purposes, that's good enough for me. Because um, really, I just want maybe I can get rid of some of these guys. They don't matter so much. Get rid of those and I'm going to hit update solve and for the full frame range. All right so now I've updated the solve. I've got it down to 1.2 and I'm going to say I'm happy with that for now. Next thing I want to do is kind of define my ground plane. Um, so I'm going to come out here and I'm going to pick a spread of points that aren't stuck up on some sticks here. So I just want to say this one, this one, this one, maybe this guy, and this guy. Just a few that represent sort of a general average area of the ground plane. Obviously this is a very undulating ground, so I'm just trying to get something to give my orientation pretty uh, nice. So I'm going to say okay. Uh, right click on those and I'm going to say set to selected. And of course, if you had measurement tools in here, um, you know, a special tool to say you can set your X, Y planes, you can set those, um, set your X, Y, Z's and everything like that. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and select those. And now with that, one more update, and I'm going to go ahead and create the rest of my items. So the camera tracker has done its job. <clears throat> it's gone through, it's created a solve, and... Um, and we can go ahead and create all of our support nodes for that. Uh, by default, it's just the camera. And you'll see if I hit create, 
it just creates this camera and it creates a link to this. So if we do any updates to our camera tracker, the camera gets updated as well, which is a really nice little feature. But we want more than that. Uh, we can just have Nuke do more for us. The Scene Plus is going to give us just about everything we can ask for. So you can see we get our tracker point cloud. And if we look at that, uh, you can see that it's a point cloud that represents sort of where those trackers lie in space, which is pretty nice. Uh, we get our camera, of course. Um, looking at that, we can see it moving through the scene, and that works out pretty well. Uh, we get a lens distortion node if we happen to be calculating it, which we weren't. Um, so I can, I'm just going to leave it in there, not a big deal. And of course, it all kicks it down, adds it into a scene, and gives us a scanline render. Remember, tab gets us between our 3D view and our 2D view there. And we can see that those stick nice. So this is great. And, and this would be a, a, just a fine way to get a camera solve. But uh, I want to go to a different place with this because I, I, this tutorial kind of exists. And what we want to do is generate a dense point cloud for this particular scene. So I'm going to go ahead and use the point cloud generator. And this works after we do a match move because once you have your camera, um, and we can plug this into here, we're no longer solving for the camera. We know what the camera is. And as long as Nuke knows what the camera is supposed to be doing, it can predict where those points are in the scene and where they, what they should be doing at a much more accurate level than, uh, than this, right? This is our sparse point cloud, All right? So if we wanted a good representation of our scene, we would use the dense point cloud generator, right? So we're going to grab our source and put it in there. And we're going to look at this scene here. And we're going to go ahead and check out the settings here. We're not going to change much with this um, because it's, you know, again, I'm just trying to get through it to, to get to a starting place. And, you know, I always like to see what happens um, a little bit by default. So we'll check it out. We're going to go ahead and analyze this sequence. Um, what it's going to do is run through the sequence and look at both um, the scene and with a camera position and decide where it can do its best analysis or where it can grab more data from. And it's gonna put keyframes in there and those will be our analysis keyframes. Um, sometimes this works out pretty well and sometimes we have, we want, we need more analysis happening and that's where we can add um, additional keyframes by using this frame spacing, okay? So you can see our accuracy for those particular keyframes is pretty good. So we're gonna go ahead with those and I'm going to hit track points while I talk about the other point. Okay, so while that's tracking, let's talk about what this is. We have point separation here, which is um, the lower the number, the denser it is, and the higher the number, the more sparse. And then the track threshold, um, which determines whether or not it places a point. And we're going to see these other aspects come alive once this track is finished. Uh, and it'll display sort of, we can filter out points and delete them as they don't fit into some aspects of what we want. All right. So this is how the dense point cloud uh, comes together. And you can see that this is a very good representation of the scene that we had um, just out there, uh, just from the video. So, um, but you can see that, you know, let's say that what I really want to do is just put some something into the tree here. I don't need the rest of this stuff. Um, now, as it, as it stands, I could easily use this to place something here, um, but we can go a little farther. I'm going to go ahead and trim up this point cloud to be a little bit neater. Right now, you can see it's just really out there. We have a two easy settings here, the angle threshold, which determines how steep of an angle we were at. You can see those coming right in based on how steep of an angle they're collected. We can kind of say, okay, well, that's maybe I only want ones that are that are represented at good angles for our camera. That's fine, right? Um, makes sense. And density threshold. So notice that as I raise this up, we'll see start seeing um, points come alive that are uh, in areas of lower density. So we're only going to, we're even going to say, you know what, it's not even dense enough for us to worry about it. We just don't even care. So I can set these to kind of call out a bunch of stuff and I'm going to hit delete, right? And when I look at this from above, I can still kind of say, maybe I don't even care about this stuff back here for my particular shot. 
Um, so I'm going to trim this up a little bit. Uh, I'm going to come up here to this button, which allows us to switch how our selection happens. By default, it's at node. And I'm going to switch it over to vertex, which allows me to come and select these points. And I'm going to command like this, and I'm just going to hit delete. All right. So here we are with our dense point cloud representing only the parts that we really care about. Maybe I can even delete some more because I know, yep, look at these little vertical sections that I could kind of care less about right through here. These are the sticks and twigs that were sticking up from the snow. I'm going to delete those. And these are sort of the holes and maybe miscalculated things. Here's some sparse areas. Delete those. I don't just really care about immediately around the tree. Where are these? Okay. And you'll see why we're trying to trim this up nice here. This sparse point here. All right. So now that we've got this nice and trimmed up to where we want to be worrying about stuff, and that's a good idea, right? Is kind of get rid of the things that we just don't, we just don't care about, right? Because it's just going to hang around and create um, more data than we need to worry about. Some of these, we can see that those are kind of miscolored, so they're probably wrong. A couple more, but I'll leave them in there. <clears throat> okay. So now we have this dense point cloud. What do we do with it? Like, what if we really wanted to, We like I said before, we could create a sphere now, right? And if we put it into our scene, you know that we can pretty quickly get it to where we want it to be. Let's say we wanted a little hobbit hole here or something. All right, we can place it right here. And we know that that's going to be right at the base of the tree. Um, you know, the problem is that, you know, yeah, it's intersecting with the particles, but it's not really going to do a nice job uh, with those particles those points uh, intersecting because they're not really it's not really a mesh that can occlude it um, but that's maybe that maybe that's what we're really after let's see now I can disconnect these I won't need them anymore so how do we make a mesh out of this um, well we can use I'm going to butcher it here the Poisson mesh generator so we get tab it look almost looks like you're writing poison but it's Poisson and you can see how nicely that works. So what the what this node does is it takes a dense um, dense collection of points, and it analyzes that and generates a uh, detailed mesh off of that based on how dense the points are. Now you can see that based on how this works, if you look up how Poisson mesh works, um, when it gets to these more sparse areas, it can start to curve up, and we can adjust that with our scale. This is one of the few nodes in, in Nuke where you get really, um, if you hover over, you can really see that uh, there's some thought into this. It says, in practice, we have found that for reconstruction, yada, yada, yada. Um, a lot of these settings are really based on things that they've uh, kind of narrowed down. So this is a really good default node. So sometimes this scale has to come down and very little moves. And I'm just going to type in uh, you know, 1.1. Right, and you can see what will happen here is that it starts to bend up and around, maybe 1.3. Right, kind of flattening out a little bit more again. 1.35. 1.18. You know, it's going to be in here somewhere. And maybe 1.25 is as good as I'm going to get. 1.5. Yeah, sometimes it's as good as it's going to get. Now we can always come back to our point cloud and we can delete points um, that might be hinting this up. And I'm not really quite sure why it's hopping up there like that. But again, I'm going to really say that I'm not going to be too concerned about it because here's what we're going to do. I don't want this to go any more wrong. So I'm going to go ahead and do a right geo right out of this and send it over to here. Tree base, 
you know, one, A, B, C. And I'm going to go ahead and execute that one. And so that is our alembic mesh out of it. Uh, we could use it right out of here, and that's fine, but uh, sometimes this leaving this uh, whole collection together um, does slow things down a little bit. There's nothing quite as fast as just doing a read geo on baked out geo and throwing it in there. <clears throat> right? There's one. So I, I had actually done this before, and just to show you how it varied a little bit, right? And a nice flat mesh like that. Now, of course, that was off of a different solve, um, so that won't work for us. But you can see how just different settings of that plus home mesh can, can kind of change things up. So here's the mesh we're going to use. Now, the nice thing is that, you know, who's to say that we have to keep it in uh, Nuke here, right? We could easily go to um, Maya if we wished and do an Olympic cache import and just bring it in from here. Right. A little scale different. And you can see the detail of this tree, right? I'm sorry, that was the improper one. There we are. And in here, you know, we can come back in if we wanted to trim these off. I'm just more comfortable working in Maya. I'm not too concerned about these front-facing meshes. And this little spike here. I can make any alterations I really want to. Get rid of this stuff. And here, I could also bring in the camera and model my uh, whatever I wanted to be in the tree right here. And you can see sort of the level of detail we've got. Here's I'll just kick it right back out. Export selection to Alembic. And I'm going to put it in this uh, EO1 underscore mod. And back to Nuke. There we go. So that fits right back into place. And I'm capable of doing something like taking this now. Putting it in our scene, giving it a project 3D. This is a sloppy way of setting it, but just to get the point across, you can see that this will take our our uh, projected information, right? And we'll add that sphere in there. And we'll put it in a place where, let's see, we'll slide it this way. And we'll just get like a nice little intersection here looking through our camera. And you can see now that how this how this works with this mesh pulling it together so nicely. Um, so yeah, so it gets you uh, it gets you pretty far along um, with things like uh, easy occlusions. Um, it's getting you a head start on, on getting this stuff together. And as a comp artist, that's a huge, huge fast forward help. So that, in a nutshell, is kind of how to do uh, the match move, generate your point cloud, and kick out your mesh, and uh, be able to move that between Nuke and Maya uh, with very little, um, very little problem. All right. Till next time.